Our next speaker is Oishi Banerjee, who will be chatting with us, who will be talking to us about how to craft an introduction, discussion, and abstract session sections. So without further ado, Oishi, please take it away. Hi all, wonderful to meet you. Give me just one second. Can you all see this? All right, so I'm going to be talking about the introductions, uh, discussions and abstract sections of how to write a research paper. So during this lecture, you're going to learn, number one, what kinds of content do you even discuss in these sections? Then you're going to learn how to organize that content so it flows logically, tells a compelling story. And three, you're going to get some general stylistic tools that help you write clearly um, and in a compelling fashion appropriate for medical AI research. So you might be wondering, why are we talking about writing skills so much? Surely it's the scientific substance that matters. And on the one hand, yes, you're right. The substance, of course, matters. But these are the real reviewer guidelines from NeurIPS this year. And you'll see that one of the key qualities that reviewers are told to judge on is clarity. Is the submission clearly written? Is it well organized? That's one of the big things that you will be graded on. Additionally, if you go ahead and take a look at the other big qualities that reviewers are looking for, it's originality, quality, and significance. And writing skills actually matter there too, because if your writing is not clear, then you might be unable to convince a reviewer that your original research is actually all that novel or exciting. You do need writing skills to succeed on any of these criteria. More intuitively, writing skills matter because just think back to any time that you've ever had to reread a paper multiple times to get what it's talking about, or maybe you've reread it multiple times and then still not understood what it's talking about, save your readers the pain. Um, you can save future readers from having to reread your paper uh, multiple times. And honestly, if, you're, if your ideas are easy to read, if they're easy to understand, that makes them easier to share around the community and more likely to gain traction. So let's start in on the introduction. I would argue that a lot of great research papers are like hourglasses. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you start off pretty broad. You start off talking to a general reader who maybe has not encountered your particular topic before. But as you get through the paper, you start introducing them more and more to your exact subject so that you can stop being quite so broad you can start start making quite specific nitty gritty claims, getting into the weeds, going deep into your particular field and your particular study. But then at the end of the paper, you once again broaden out your focus in order to contextualize your research, in order to make it clear uh, what the broader consequences of your work are for society, for the research community. So how does this general hourglass structure actually line up with the sections of the research paper? I'd argue it goes mostly like this. The introduction is written at a pretty broad level. It is supposed to be quite accessible to a pretty general audience. But once people have gotten through your introduction and certainly your related work section, then you can get into the little nitty gritty details of the methods and results. Then the discussion section, which we'll also be talking about today, once again, broadens out your focus and should leave people with an understanding of how your research fits into the entire world. So let's talk about the introduction. The introduction can generally be broken down into two main sections. The first is where you take the general reader off the street and introduce them, orient them in your particular problem. Part two is where you talk about, well, once, we've, once we know what the problem is, how am I proposing to solve this, pro this problem? The very first question that you need to answer is what is the problem? And once again, use the right level of detail when you're doing this section. Remember that you're probably talking to readers who they're smart, they're engaged, but they might not know about your topic. This might be the very first paper uh, in this question that they've ever read. So here are how some real successful papers have talked about um, 
talked at the very start of the paper about what is the problem. Um, for example, here is a problem. This is a paper actually from medical AI, but it talks about social inequity. So this is a bit of a social science problem. The problem they're trying to solve is racial and gender inequity. A lot of other papers will talk about resource constraints, that something is too expensive or it takes too much time, it takes too much specialist effort right now. And then, of course, a lot of papers in medical AI are going to talk about specific health problems, like this is a disease, it's killing this many people, we need to, we need to stop this. So these are some categories of the problems, um, and this is how you might talk about the big problem you're trying to solve. And of course, uh, there are other many, many other kinds of problems in the world. These are just some very common examples of medical AI. All right, so now let's actually go through an example. You might recall from earlier presentations in this intensive that there's a paper called CXR Repair. And CXR Repair was a uh, was an attempt to generate radiology reports for chest x-rays automatically. Now imagine we're in a world where CXR Repair hasn't been published yet. You, in fact, are the authors of a study just like CXR Repair, and you're trying to figure out how to introduce your work to the world. Imagine that you took this stab at explaining the problem. What would you fix in this? Well, assuming that this is going to a general AI venue, your readers are probably going to be software engineers, CS undergrads, CS professors, but they may not be doctors. And so what I'd say is an issue here is it kind of just throws the term CXR report out there and your particular readers might not know what that means. So here are some possible fixes. One easy fix is actually introduce the term CXR so that you don't just sprinkle in abbreviations and then let people get lost. That's a bad idea. Additionally, I would argue that to someone who's not a doctor, you might not know what a CXR, what a re report is, what a radiology report is. So that too is worth giving, it's worth giving a quick explanation. Oh, sorry. Um, I would say that if you've got unfamiliar technical terms, please do take the time to throw in, you know, a short half a sentence that explains what you're talking about. Um, it can make your paper much more accessible. It can prevent you from just losing readers along the way over something that was very easily fixed. All right, so you've introduced what the problem is. Part two, why should people care about it? Now, fortunately, in medical AI, we're often working on something that very directly impacts human lives and human well-being. So the answer to this question is often self-explanatory. But once again, let's take a look at some examples for how researchers have justified uh, why, why people should care about their, their problem. A common answer in medical AI is that it provides a direct benefit to patients. We are improving patient outcomes. What's also common is that people will say, we're improving the lives of doctors, we're reducing their workload, uh, we're going to let them focus on, on things that they want to focus on instead. A third answer that is also quite common um, is that we may not be directly helping human lives, but we're going to get there indirectly because we are lowering costs or we're lowering uh, some, some kind of technical effort. So this is still a valid way to answer the question. That makes it pretty clear, um, you know, how your particular work is going to benefit the world. Once again, imagine that you are the writer of a study just like CXR Repair. How would you improve this argument to get people to care about your problem? So an issue that I have with this particular argument is that improving hospital procedures, it's kind of impersonal. And so it's a little bit difficult to see who is the real human who's going to be helped on the other end of this research. So a way to fix that is to get a bit more specific. Say that when we're improving hospital procedures, really what we're doing is we're reducing radiologist workloads. We're shortening turnaround times. So that makes it a bit more concrete and starts to make it clear how a real person is going to be helped by this work. Next up, if you can possibly bring it back to particular patients, um, 
bring it back to the people you're helping. That's really powerful. All right, next up, we've explained what the problem is. We've explained why people should generally care about solving the problem. But next up, you have to explain why they should care so much that they should read an entire technical paper about it. What makes this such a hard problem that it deserves an entire article? In the section, you need to explain why your problem is unique, why it's difficult, why, why it deserves new novel research to be devoted to it. This section will often draw heavily on your related works, so definitely take inspiration from your lit review. This section starts to get a little bit trickier than what we've seen before. You still need to convince the average general reader, but I would argue that there is now a second audience that you need to address. You also need to convince any experts in the field. And by experts, I mean the kinds of people who have already read 10 papers on this topic, the people who have maybe written 10 papers on this topic. At this point, you need to start addressing both of these audiences and they're going to expect different things. So a reasonable question that you might have is, you know, this is an intro. Why are we talking to experts? Shouldn't the experts understand that this section is not for them and that they should go down to the methods and results if they want to be entertained? And you know, that's a valid question, but ideally the authors who you've cited are gonna be the ones citing you next time. You want them to take your research, be like, that is so smart. I totally trust the solution. I'm gonna integrate it into all of my studies going forward. And to achieve that, they need to trust your idea of the problem. If they don't think that your understanding of what makes the problem hard matches their understanding, they may just not trust your understanding of the solution. So how do you convince the experts that you have the right idea of what the problem is and why it's difficult? Well, problems tend to exist on a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you've got very new fields that have very few papers written about them. Perhaps you are the first person to ever work with this kind of data. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have mature, well-developed fields. These often have a long literature. Lots of people have already read and written about this subject. And depending on where your problem is on the spectrum, the experts are going to expect you to answer, answer the question of why is this problem hard differently. And specifically, if you're in a young field, you're probably going to be addressing really broad challenges like, does this data contain any useful signal? Does this data even relate to the outcome of interest? Or what model architecture makes sense? Should it be a gigantic neural network? Should it be a logistic regression model? If you're brand new to the field, if the field is brand new, then maybe people don't even know that. You might even have a broader question of like, is this task even possible right now? Do we need to check in in 30 years when science has given us a totally new suite of tools to handle this? On the other hand, if you're in an older field, those broad questions might still be in play, but they're probably not the focus because chances are by now, a bunch of prior studies have revealed a lot more immediate stumbling blocks, a lot more nitty gritty issues that need to be solved before you can go fix the broad question. And so that means that at this point in an older field, you're probably gonna focus more on narrow challenges, which have been pointed out as these very small obstacles um, that exist by prior research. And so you might be focusing on questions like, prior work has neglected a very specific aspect of the problem. Can we address just this one specific aspect? Or recent papers have shown like very specific model weaknesses. So models exist, they generally do fine, but like they underperform in a couple of cases. Can we fix one exact error mode? Here's an example of a, pro of a real paper that was in a newer field and how they address the question. So this paper is in the field of temporal reasoning. That's uh, it's trying to get neural networks to reason about space and time using images. That's, that's pretty hard. And it's a relatively, it's on the newer side as field goes. And so the question that they ask is, you know, even if you had 400 million literal text image pairs, which are basically if you had a large, large amount of the gold standard data in image interpretation, 
would you get a model that could solve the problem? And their answer is no, it's not obvious that even the best data, so-called best data would get you there. So that's a pretty broad problem for a relatively young field. Now here is an example of a more in the middle problem. The question here is, can breast cancer AI screening generalize to new places? You'll notice that that's still a pretty broad problem. It's still gonna require quite a few studies to, to give a conclusive answer to this. But um, we've gotten a little more specific. We're not talking about is breast cancer AI screening even possible? We're asking, can it generalize to new settings? Now here is an example of a paper that is in quite a well-developed field that is now asking a very specific question. Can metadata be used to select positive pairs for medical imaging contrastive learning? So this is in the field of CXR interpretation. You'll notice that at this point, we are talking about a very specific weakness, a very specific gap in prior papers that prior papers have not addressed this really quite niche question. So these are three examples, um, I think, that they hit generally all three sections of the spectrum. All right, let's go back and imagine that we are the writers of CXR repair or something very much like it. How would you improve this argument for a chest X-ray report generation problem? And this one's gonna be a bit, bit more nuanced. So the answer here may not be quite so obvious, but in general, I don't love this argument for report generation because yeah, it's difficult to diagnose diseases from chest x-rays. They're not the highest quality type of imaging out there, but that's a pretty broad challenge across the entire big field of chest x-ray interpretation. So as a result, I would say that this challenge is a bit too broad. It's the big, broad challenge. It's not actually what recent papers are focusing on. Instead, it's good to hone in on what makes your little niche of report generation specifically hard. So a more compelling argument to me would be something that talks specifically about report generation, not just about chest x-rays in general. Like previous report generation models have been having trouble with producing reports that get all of the relevant features without, you know, messing up introducing new information that doesn't exist or introducing just wrong information. So at this point, we've got a well-developed field, and so we should have a bit more of a narrow answer. All right, so hopefully by this point, you've oriented readers in what your problem is, why they should care about it, why they should care so much, and why it's so hard that they should read an entire paper about it. Next up, you have to talk about your solution. So explain your solution at a pretty high level and make sure to emphasize the main highlights of your approach. So think about what is the star, what has the starring role? What is the coolest thing about your idea? and make sure that is front and center. Here are a couple examples of real papers uh, introducing their solution. Give you a moment to read those. You'll notice that in the world of AI, there's a lot of catchy names. Uh, they are not required, but they are certainly welcome. We've got Chinchilla, we've got Biovert, we've got Convert. People love their acronyms. All right, so now imagine that you are the writer of CXR Repair. Remember that what made CXR Repair cool was that it had an interesting training and an interesting uh, inference procedure. Is this a good way of introducing CXR Repair? I would argue that there's a bit of a problem here. And the problem is one of emphasis. The focus here is misplaced. It gives us all of these technical details about the architecture, about how big or not big the model is, but it doesn't really focus on what's really cool about the study, which is not the architecture, it's the training and inference uh, procedure. So this would be an improvement. Number one, 
it doesn't waste focus on the architecture details because that's not what has the starring role here. Save those gory model details for the methods section. Additionally, it goes ahead and expands, it, fo it adds focus to the particular training and evaluation procedures. So basically just think about, be very clear about what makes your solution interesting, what, what parts are really important, and make sure you allocate the reader's energy accordingly. All right, so hopefully now you've explained what your solution is. Now you have to get people interested in it. What makes your solution smart? And the word smart here is doing double duty. You've got to both explain why it's new, why it's novel, why it's got that cool factor, but you also have to explain that it's sensible, that it's relatively likely to work, that it's not like completely random pie in the sky stuff. So that's a bit of a tension there. You've got to explain that it's new and exciting, but also that it's grounded and reasonable. Yes, those two things are a little bit at odds, but you've got to do both. Once again, you're going to be splitting your focus to two different audiences. Yes, of course, you should be clear and accessible and compelling to the average reader, but that's not sufficient. You also have to be talking to the experts because they are the ones who are the likeliest to reuse your idea, to take it and re-implement it in their own work. And that's of course, you know, the ultimate goal. So how do you explain the cool factor? Well, a pretty common example, as you'll see from these, uh, from these particular excerpts, is people will say how their work differs from past work. We revisit the question. We are revisiting prior assumptions. Or, you know, the current state of the art is doing this, but we think they need to do this. Or compared to existing methods, we do X, Y, Z. So all three of these examples are saying, like, prior work is like this, we are different. They also go ahead and give some justification for why, yeah, we're so different, but we're also reasonable. Here's why the thing we're doing makes sense. And this part might be a little bit more, a little bit more technical, might get into the weeds of like your exact topic. Explain why your solution will fix the problem or at least will do a better job of fixing it than prior work would. So once again, let's go ahead and pretend that we are in the world of CXR repair. And this is the writer's first attempt at explaining that their solution is smart, that it is both cool and exciting, but also perfectly reasonable given prior work. What could be fixed? Well, this is actually a pretty good start. I would argue that this gets the novelty part right. It says like, past solutions have done this, we are different. But it's not really great at the reasonable part. It's not clear why this difference is going to make a is going to make an impact. How are you fixing the problem? So you would need to go ahead and provide some like subject specific justification for yeah, we're, yes, we're different and we think it's a smart idea. We think it's more likely to work. Basically, you should be putting a twist on prior work and you should justify that twist. All right, so hopefully now people know what your problem is, why it matters, what is your solution, why is a good solution. At this point, you go ahead and spoil your results section. Give people a quick overview of like, did it work? How did it work? And the format of the section will actually vary a lot across studies. So we're gonna see a couple of examples of how people tackle this. Um, in one case, here is just a short one sentence summary. It generally says that, yeah, we it worked, it did better than what we were comparing it against. Here we have a slightly longer example. Uh, this has two sentences, and at this point, it's also got specific numbers. And notice in the first case that they generally just said, oh, we reduced inference costs, we did better, we outperformed. In this case, we're getting specific metrics. So these are both valid ways of, of approaching the problem and different studies are going to use different approaches. Going past format, you'll notice that the content here is a bit different um, because there are many different ways of measuring success. So pull out whatever metrics that you, you think are important. In the first case, they think that performance is important. They also think that efficiency is important. So they talk about reduced model size. 
in this uh, second case, it's just all about performance. And so they say, you know, we are looking at this particular metric and they gave, gave examples of the numbers they got. Optionally, some studies are going to go way more in depth on this part of the introduction. So here is an example from the BioBert paper where they went ahead and just like bullet pointed a whole bunch of different contributions they made. And in some places, these are contributions in the methods. Like here, it's not really about the results. It's about this interesting, the first thing is, uh, the first bullet point is about this interesting approach that they had. But then they do also have bullet points for, hey, part of the novelty is we got great results. We got better results than anyone else has gotten. So they were quite explicit and you know quite elaborate in the section. You will also see this format bullet points or one, two, three outline contributions in some other papers. All right, so hopefully by the end of the introduction, your readers are gonna be honorary experts in your field. They are now ready for more specific material for the narrowing of the hourglass. Now let's move on to the discussion and the conclusion. So we're gonna skip over the methods and results for now. That's gonna be saved for a different lecture. And we're gonna talk about broadening out your focus once more to, um, to the broader implications of your study. You should not be introducing new numbers here. Don't do new statistics. Don't introduce brand new patterns. Um, basically, I would say that all the facts of your results should be introduced in the results section. What you can do here is that the results section will probably throw a lot of different numbers at readers. You should now provide some context for how to understand those numbers, which ones were important, why do they matter? So you should be providing commentary to like help readers orient themselves on how to understand the facts. You're doing the interpretation now. Uh, beyond that though, the length and the structure of the discussion slash conclusion will vary a lot across different studies. You could probably guess at the fact that there's some variance given that people can't decide whether this is called a discussion or a conclusion. Um, so you should be checking out similar papers to get an exact idea of how uh, authors like you handle this. But we're gonna discuss some general patterns that you might see. Uh, for example, it's pretty common to open with a brief summary, remind people what you did in this paper and optionally what the main takeaway was. For example, uh, here some people will just do like a one sentence uh, review of this is the general experiment we did. Some people will do both the approach and then give you the main result that we tried this random patch sampling inference strategy. Main results were we had high performance, we had good inference speeds. All right, next up is there's generally some sort of in-depth discussion, but what this is gonna look like is gonna vary a lot across different studies. I'll discuss some common topics that uh, come up here, but you should really customize the section based on your exact study. Not all of these topics are gonna apply to everybody. Something that you will see is uh, some studies are implicitly have several research questions folded inside them. So if your study addressed any sub questions, this is a great time to review each of the individual answers. And some people will be very explicit about this. For example, um, a, a format I've seen in some papers is you let's say you've got a couple of different questions just folded in. You've got a couple of research questions implicit in your premise. Call those out in bold, put, to, put out, this was research question one, this was research question two, give the quick answer, yes, not necessarily. And then give the justification for what about the results, what particular numbers led you to this conclusion. Something else that is quite common is sometimes you're gonna be able to break down your data by category. We'll get into what we mean by category. And you might see that, oh, there's a general trend that holds across categories. That's good to know. You might see that actually there's differences across categories. There's some unevenness, some inconsistencies. That's also great to point out. And if you can give a reason for why those inconsistencies are appearing, if you can give a possible explanation, you know that's even better. Here's an example of a paper that uh, was breaking results down by category specifically they break things down by metrics. Like first they talk about AUCs, then they go ahead and talk about specificity. 
They also break things down by disease because this paper looked at a bunch of different diseases. So first they talk about, um, they give numbers for each specific disease of interest. Then they go ahead and talk about specifically the high specificity in detecting ACL tears and what are the implications of that. What's also quite common is to do some sort of analysis across specific demographics. For example, this was a uh, this was a paper that had some of their data from the UK, pulled some of their data from the US. Those are two different populations. They did in fact see slightly different results or actually pretty different results across those two populations. So you can do some analysis of like different subgroups, see whether your model treats everybody the same. Another thing you will see co uh, commonly is people will explicitly compare and contrast their results with what prior work found. And I would say there's generally two different modes of how to approach this. In competition mode, it's what it sounds like. You're going head to head with a specific prior paper. Um, you might be specifically like trying to compare your model against the prior state of the art. So in this section, you might say, oh, we improved on prior results. We had a better F1 score than anybody else. Or our work is now state of the art. We beat the prior title holders. Meanwhile, some papers are gonna be in collaboration mode where it's not necessarily you're trying to beat one specific prior model. It's that maybe prior work has brought up a possible pattern, has brought up a possible theory. And you are saying, hey, we investigated further. Did we prove or disprove the theory? Did we find more evidence? Here are some examples of papers that were in competition mode. You will see that there are a lot of different axes, once again, for competition. Um, this was a paper that said, you know, we're more versatile than anybody else. Our model was able to do more tasks. Then uh, this is a paper where the, the area of competition was how small are we or how well do we perform? So we performed Gopher, we uh, out, sorry, we outperformed Gopher, we outperformed even larger models. So that's the metric of success here. And then of course, a lot of papers are just straight up gonna be about performance that we got better performance numbers, we got higher accuracy, better AUC than prior authors. In contrast, here are some papers that are in collaboration mode, and I'm going to specifically highlight some phrases that you'll often uh, find useful if you are in collaboration mode. You might say that your findings conflict with prior theories, conflict with prior patterns that uh, other authors have discovered. On the other hand, maybe your evidence lines up with prior evidence and it really reinforces maybe an existing theory. So in that case, you might say that our findings are consistent with prior, prior results. You wanna go one step further. Um, you might say that your findings extend prior work. Perhaps prior work didn't talk about medicine. They suggested that some theory apply, but they had never tried it on medical images. You might say our findings extend prior work to the medical image setting. Yes, and if you're improv geeks. Another common thing to do is that if any of your findings surprised you or if they potentially would surprise a reader, feel free to comment on that. And once again, if you have explanations, please do give them. Or even if you have theories, put them forth. Another huge part that's really important in the discussion section is a lot of studies will talk about potential issues in their studies. So this is a time for transparency and for honest self-reflection. Does your study have any known limitations? Are there ethical concerns? This can be a tricky, tricky part of the study to write. So let's go through some examples. Um, a common issue that people will call out in their own medical AI work is that there could be issues with, issues with data. Um, for example, this particular study said that there were issues of unmeasured confounding and selection bias, or that there could be those issues. Also, uh, if you're in the world of medical AI, realistically, you don't have infinite money to do your studies. And so there's going to be some issues or at least some limitations, constraints on your development. Um, for example, papers will say, you know, we did not perform an exhaustive hyperparameter search. 
Maybe you think that you could only afford to run a model of one size, but had you made it larger, um, you would have gotten better performance. That's something to mention here. The prior issues that we discussed were issues perhaps of study design, but you might also have issues with your model. Maybe you think your study design was like fine, but the resulting model just has a failure mode. For example, in CXR repair, they called out the fact that one of the models they developed was prone to repeating information. Additionally, this is a great time to talk about ethical issues, which are really quite important in the world of medical AI. It's so high stakes. So um, some models will say that, you know, there's issues around propagating social biases, stereotypes. There could be privacy issues. Maybe it's possible to reverse engineer like people's private information from your model. Another important constraint that might be relevant is perhaps there's some sort of heavy research usage. Perhaps your study, while really important and helpful, is just inherently inaccessible. Um, for example, if you've got a gigantic model that took forever and a half to train, that could be hard to deploy in lower resource regions. All right, so now that we've got everyone all down on our studies, we go ahead and explore ideas for future work. We take that negative and turn it into a positive. Um, because oftentimes calling out the specific issues in your work can inspire ideas for further validation for next steps. So make it clear to future authors what you think the next paper in this field should be about. So a lot of people will call for, you know, the same paper, but a little bit to the left, similar study designs. Um, in that case, you might call for a slightly different technical approach. You might call for different data. This is quite common that people think they didn't have enough data or they didn't have sufficiently diverse data. Um, and for example, this particular uh, study found that by chance, most of their images were acquired on devices made by one specific manufacturer. Well, that's a diversity issue. Maybe your model wouldn't generalize. You might also see calls for uh, taking the study and replicating it in a slightly different field. For example, if you had an approach, you think it worked great, but it needs to be tried out on more data types. Well, that's a great thing to mention here. You will also see that some fields, uh, so that some papers will call for entirely new kinds of studies to be done on the subject. For example, if you had um, some known issue in your model, let's say that you, you saw it was exhibiting some sort of bias, you might go ahead and say, hey, AI ethics people, can you please help us out? Can you please like create the tools that researchers like me need to fix this issue? Something else that will happen in medical AI papers is you might call for like deeper understanding of the biology. Something that might happen is you, you observe like a weird pattern, some kind of weird scientific phenomenon that you have evidence for, but no, you don't understand why it's happening or why it works like that. So you might issue a call to the biologists out there of like, hey, this is interesting. I found an interesting discrepancy. I found a protein that behaves not the way I would expect, et cetera, et cetera. You can make calls for like deeper biology research. Additionally, what's very common is a general call for further validation because while medical AI research produces tons of great models all the time, um, I'm not sure that auth most authors would trust those models to be deployed randomly in hospitals immediately. So you'll often see a uh, further call for randomized clinical trials or something of that sort. Finally, talk about the broader implications of your research, general consequences for society. And this section is often going to very closely mirror your introduction. For example, if your research has benefits to patients, remind us of that. If it helps doctors, say that too, bring it back to the people who you're helping. And once again, if it's a little bit more indirect, like if you are reducing costs um, or if you're reducing the amount of effort required to do something, call that out as well. Okay, so hopefully now you know how to write the introduction, know how to write the discussion. We're gonna get into the abstract. And really the abstract pulls together 
um, content from the discussion and from the introduction. So this is gonna sound really quite familiar, the kinds of content discussed here. You're gonna really hit the highlights of those two sections. Here is a condensed version of what goes into the abstract. Uh, you will notice it is an hourglass. It is a tinier hourglass. It doesn't necessarily get quite so narrow and niche in the middle. And these are the uh, questions that you're gonna introduce. These questions will look familiar. I find it helpful to hit the abstract only after I've written the rest of the paper, because usually once you've done all your thinking on the introduction and this, the discussion, it's quite clear how to answer all of these questions for the abstract. All right, so we are going to go through um, a very quick example of an abstract. Great abstracts waste no space. This abstract is gonna be only six sentences long, it pack, but it packs in so much content that I feel like I could just intelligently discuss this paper even though I have not read it, at least not anytime recently. Um, let's see how this works. Here is sentence one. So what's going on here? What questions does it answer? Well, right off the bat, it tells us what is the problem? And the problem is apparently a reliance on large label data sets hundreds of the thousands of examples per data set. Well, why does that matter? Well, it's implied that, you know, you can't count on that much data to be available all the time. Sentence two, again, packed with content. What's going on here? Actually, a lot of stuff is going on here. Once again, we address what is the problem and I would say that a problem here is also appendicitis, a specific medical issue. Um, you'll notice that because appendicitis was in the second sentence, it didn't show up in sentence one, that it's really secondary. It is less emphasized. The starring problem of this paper is the data issue. And then the context where we're exploring that is appendicitis. Why does appendicitis matter? Well, apparently it's really common and it's life-threatening. That's, that's a big issue. Next up, we get into what is the solution? And the solution is to build a model that de detects appendicitis with minimal data, apparently less than 500 data points, which is really small given the hundreds of thousands mentioned in sentence one. And this uh, the sentence also tells us, you know, why is the solution novel? Why is it cool and exciting? Well, 500 is way less than hundreds of thousands. So that right there, I think, proves the cool factor. Sentence three, give you a chance to read it. So what's going on here? Well, we're uh, justifying the solution here. How is the solution novel? And also how is it sensible? We kind of got the novelty part explained before that it's just a really small amount of data. And now we're proving that it's sensible by saying, hey, we're not just throwing a model in the deep end with minimal data. We're pre-training it on natural videos, which are abundant, so that it has a chance of succeeding in this very low data setting. Sentence four. We're now getting to the narrowing of the hourglass, which is why there's a lot more numbers and specifics here. So what's going on here? Well, we're once again revisiting the question of what is the solution we're getting, but we're now doing it in somewhat more detail. This is kind of the condensed version of the methods section. So apparently it's video pre-training plus fine tuning, more specifics about the exact data sets that are being used. And yeah, this is, this is the bottleneck part of the hourglass. So we did the tiny version of the method section. Now we're doing the tiny version of the results. Um, we're calling this particular paper decided to mention the findings and to use specific numbers. Some papers will mention exact numbers in the abstract. Others will leave uh, will leave it a little bit more vague. Their findings are apparently that their pre-training improves performance. So this seems like a promising approach. 
Sentence six, six out of six. So this is the this is the end of the abstract, the grand finale. And you'll notice that what they're doing here is they're exploring that big discussion question of what are the implications? What are the general consequences for the world? And the answer is apparently that data costs could be cut across many medical tasks. So it's not just about appendicitis, it could be about many other, many other tasks as well. And presumably this could help a lot of different patients. So that makes it clear, you know, the human connection of what's the actual human impact of solving this problem. So essentially we had just six sentences. Uh, this is the first thing that anyone encounters when they hit your paper. This is the billboard for the paper. And hopefully in just those six sentences, you've gotten, you've gotten a pretty good idea of what happens in this paper. You can now discuss the general paper intelligently in dinner conversation. All right, so forgive my slightly laggy computer. All right, so that gets us through the abstract, uh, got us through the entire hourglass uh, format. We are now going to discuss some general style tools that you can use in the abstract in any of these sections in order to just make your prose great and clear for a medical AI research paper. I would argue that in the world of medical AI, Papers that are stylish are papers that are accessible, or style, style and accessibility are pretty much hand in hand. They're very heavily correlated. Now, your first question might be accessible to who? Like, does a seventh grader need to be able to read my paper? And I would say no. Um, when you're writing up medical AI research for academic venues, assume that your readers have some sort of formal academic training in medicine or AI. But that said, you should not assume that they're already experts in your particular topic, that they're already invested in your particular topic. Um, of course, you should try to impress the experts too, but don't forget that you might be talking to just general AI engineers who don't know anything about medical AI specifically. In general, I would argue that in the wide world of writing, if you think back to what your English teachers have taught you, um, they've, probably been, they've probably taught you that style matters a lot and that stylistic complexity matters a lot. For example, in the world of avant-garde film, regular film, poetry, I'd say that um, the energy of readers and writers is split pretty evenly between clever content, sure, but also stylistic complexity. Style matters a lot and people define style as like, you know, does it sound beautiful? Does it sound poetic? Does it have complex sentence structures? Does it use a thesaurus, et cetera, et cetera? Throw all of that out the window when you're in medical AI research. All due respect to English teachers, all that advice of stylistic complexity does not really help here. I would say that this is how readers and writers' energy should be split um, when you're in medical AI research. The focus should be hugely on the clever content and only a little bit of stylistic flourish is allowed. And the reason for that is that if you're writing a medical AI research paper, your content is already hard enough. Medicine is hard, AI is hard. Um, basically conserve your reader's energy and don't spend brain power on any kind of like stylistic flourishes. Instead, you should be aiming for stylistic simplicity. And let's break that down a little bit to get more concrete about what I mean here. Here's an example of stylistic simplicity. Um, you, you'll remember earlier on that we had an example of a paper that just threw the term CXR report at you, or the example of a made-up paper. You shouldn't do that. Define unfamiliar technical terms and abbreviations as they appear, when they first appear. And as a hint here, think about your audience. Medical audiences will need more AI explanations than you might expect. AI audiences are gonna need more medical explanations than you might expect. You're in the nexus of these two fields. And so all of this stuff might come naturally to you, but if you're talking to doctors, you might need to explain what a neural network is. You might need to explain what overfitting is, what generalization is. Meanwhile, if you're talking to an AI audience, you're gonna to have to explain what a CXR report is. 
Um, you might have to explain that a CT scan is some kind of 3D cross-sectional data. That's something that is incredibly obvious to a medical audience, but a random AI person might not know it. Additionally, um, stick to a limited vocabulary. Don't bury terms just for the fun of it. My English teachers would be horrified by the fact that I'm saying this because they did love it when you had many different ways of expressing the same concept. For example, they would an English teacher might say it's great to say CXR report pairs and then image text pairs and then pairs of chest x-rays and radiology reports. Keep it fresh, keep it exciting. Don't do that. What you should do in a medical AI research paper is stick, find your exact technical terms that you like and stick to them. Be consistent, keep it simple. More generally, in the world of medical AI research, um, try to declutter. So cut minutia that pull focus from your main story. You'll remember we had this example of, um, you know, an alternate version of the CXR report, uh, CXR repair paper that got into all the gory details of the architecture when first introducing its solution. Don't do that. Um, be very clear about what the core of your argument is. Streamline. Don't have additional. Just don't have additional clutter. This is especially true in the uh, intro and the discussion and the abstract, which are more general. Um, of course, the little details might be more appreciated elsewhere, like in the method section, maybe in the results section. More generally, chop up long, windy sentences. Um, complicated sentences are not really a virtue here, unlike in other kinds of writing. I would say you should prune your grammar, prune your syntax aggressively. The NIH recommends under 20 words per, sentences, uh, per sentence when you're writing a proposal. I think that's a pretty good guideline uh, for medical AI research too. It's a pretty similar type of writing. And as a hint, let's say that you are proofreading your paper and you find a gigantic sentence like this first one. You should go ahead and split that up into two ideas. In this first case, it's all one sentence. The second, uh, the second example has all the same content, but splits it into two sentences. Now you might find that you have issues preserving flow because maybe it is all one idea to you. And so splitting it up into two sentences suddenly makes it sound disjointed. Transition words are your friend here. For example, um, in, this in this specific case, when I was trying to split up this gigantic sentence, I use the word furthermore to make it clear that these ideas are still very linked. The second part is building on the first part. So use transition phrases to preserve flow. Uh, this is a great tool for breaking up gigantic sentences. Another great tip here is that oftentimes in medical AI research, you're gonna be presenting some kind of like hard but important technical concept. And if you've got, say, a math formula that is hard to understand, but is the basis for your entire paper, you really need people to understand it. Otherwise, they're just going to be lost. And a great idea there is to use multimedia. Use multiple modalities in order to deliver your message. For example, CXR repair, in order to introduce the idea of like similarity between an image and a text used three different kinds of media to get their message across. They used text, they used a figure, and then they used just straight up mathematical notation, a formula. And the idea here is that different readers are gonna respond best to different kinds of communication. You might have some readers who love a great clean mathematical formula. You have other readers who are visual learners. And if you've got a hard technical concept, just by all means, bombard them with multiple ways of understanding it so that there's something for every kind of reader. Another big tip is that people quite naturally focus on beginnings. So that means that the abstract, the billboard, the first thing people see of their paper of the paper is very important, it means that the introduction is important, but it also applies at the paragraph level. People have more energy at the start of a paragraph than they do in the middle, probably even at the end. So you should use topic sentences freely. Use topic sentences that get the entire point of your paragraph across. Let the rest of the paragraph just provide 
additional justification or additional detail. As a hint here, um, it can be really great if your paper is understandable and more or less coherent just from reading the topic sentences. That can be a pretty good sign of whether you've done a good job signposting the content of each paragraph with your topic sentence. All right, so hopefully at this point, you are now able to choose the kinds of content that go in your intro discussion and abstract. You know how to organize it and roughly why it's organized that way. And hopefully you also know some stylistic tips that will help you write great scientific prose. As a final hint, even the best writing rules do not apply in every single situation. So when in doubt, um, feel free to check what specific papers are doing, what similar papers in similar venues have chosen to do. Happy writing. Thank you, Oishi, for the fantastic lecture and for going through these very uh, practical tips of how to go about writing these important sections.